The original Night Stalker is a media epithet for an unidentified serial killer and rapist who committed 50 rapes in Northern California and murdered 12 people in Southern California from 1979 through 1986. Other monikers include the East Area Rapist, the Diamond Knot Killer, and since 2013, he has also been referred to as the Golden State Killer. The crimes initially centered on the then unincorporated areas of Carmichael, Citrus Heights and Rancho Cordova, all east of Sacramento, where at least 50 women were sexually assaulted between June 18, 1976, and July 5, 1979. In 2001, several of the Northern California rapes were linked by DNA to murders in Southern California. All of the DNA-linked rapes occurred in Contra Costa County, but the distinctive modus operandi mo, of the rapist makes it extremely likely that the same man was also responsible for the attacks in the Sacramento area. His last crime and the only one after 1981 was in 1986. The original Night Stalker has never been apprehended. Several suspects have been cleared through DNA, alibi, or other investigative means and methods. On June 15, 2016, the FBI and local law enforcement agencies conducted a press conference to announce a nationwide push into $50.00 oh, 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 reward for his capture. They plan to erect electronic billboards nationwide and other forms of exposure for the push. Crimes California law enforcement authorities estimate 50 rapes in the California counties of Sacramento, Contra Costa, Stanislaus, San Joaquin, Alameda, Santa Clara and Yolo were committed by the original Night Stalker. DNA evidence conclusively links him to eight murders in Goleta, Ventura, Dana Point, and Irvine, California, with two other murders in Goleta linked by Mo but not DNA. East Area Rapist Crimes Various police sketches of the East Area Rapist. These were the three the FBI focused on when it reopened the case June 2016. The Sacramento East Area Rapist is believed to have started as a prolific burglar, only later graduating to rape. His initial modus operandi was to stalk middle-class neighborhoods at night looking for women who lived in single-story homes, generally located near a school, creek, or other open space that afforded a quick escape. Although he originally targeted women either alone in their homes or with children, he later came to prefer attacking couples instead. East Area Rapist Crimes June 18, 76 to the 1st of October 79 FBI Investigation on June 15, 2016, the FBI released further information in relation to the crimes including new composite sketches, victims and investigator testimony. The initiative includes a national database to support law enforcement investigating the crimes, and to handle tips and information. Geographic Profile Geographic profiling seems to indicate he may have had a base in Carmichael or Rancho Cordova during the initial set of attacks. Murders of Brian and Katie Majore On the night of February 2, 1978, a young Sacramento couple, Brian and Katie Majore, were walking their dog in the Rancho Cordova area, close to where several East Area rapist attacks had taken place. On June 15, 2016, the FBI announced that they were confident the East Area Rapist murdered the Magiors. Original Night Stalker Crimes 1979 On October 1, an intruder broke in and tied up a Goleta couple. The attacker alarmed them by chanting, I'm going to kill them, to himself. When he left the room, the man and then the woman made attempts to escape during which the woman screamed. Realizing the alarm had been raised, the intruder fled. A neighbor, who was an FBI agent, responded to the noise and pursued the perpetrator, 
who abandoned the bike he was on and fled on foot through local backyards. The attacker also abandoned a knife at this point. The attack was later linked physically to the Offerman Manning murders by shoe prints and the same roll of twine being used to bind the victims. On December 30th, Dr. Robert Offerman, 44, and Dr. Deborah Alexander Manning, 35, were found shot dead at Offerman's condominium on Avenida de Picanha in Goleta. The bindings on Offerman were untied, indicating he had apparently lunged at the attacker. Neighbors heard the gunshots but failed to respond to them, attributing them to innocuous causes. Prints from a large dog were found at the scene, leading to speculation that the killer may have brought it with him. There is evidence that he fed the dog some leftover Christmas turkey from the fridge. The killer also broke into the adjoining residence, to the west of the crime scene, which was vacant at the time, and stole a bicycle from a third residence in the same complex. The bicycle was later found abandoned on a street to the north of the crime scene. 1980 On March 13, Charlene Smith, 33, and Lyman Smith, 43, who was about to be appointed a judge, were found murdered in their home in Ventura. Charlene had also been raped. A log from the fireplace was used to bludgeon both the victims to death. Their wrists and ankles had been bound with a drapery cord. An unusual Chinese knot, known as the diamond knot, was used on their wrists. On August 19, Keith Harrington, 24, and Patrice Harrington, 27, were found bludgeoned to death in their home on Cockle Shell Drive in the Nigel Shores gated community in Dana Point. Patrice had also been raped, although there was evidence that the Harringtons were bound at the wrist and ankles. No ligatures or murder weapon were found at the scene. The Harringtons had been married for three months at the time of their deaths. Patrice was a nurse in Irvine while Keith was a medical student at the University of California, Irvine. 1981 On February 6, Manuela Whithun, 28, was raped and murdered in her home in Irvine. Again, while the body showed signs of being tied before being bludgeoned, no ligatures, or murder weapon, were found at the scene. The victim was married but her husband was recuperating from an illness in the hospital. Thus, she was alone at the time of the attack. A lamp and crystal curio were removed from her house, presumably by the killer. Also, detectives remarked that Whithun's television was found in the backyard, which was possibly the killer's attempt to make it appear as a botched robbery. On July 27, 1981, Carrie Domingo, 35, and Gregory Sanchez, 27, became the 10th and 11th murder victims of the original Night Stalker. Both were attacked in the Domingo on Toltec Way in Goleta, several blocks south of the Offerman Manning crime scene. Their murder has been linked to the, the original Night Stalker by DNA left at the scene. He is believed to have broken into the home in Goleta, which was up for sale at the time of the attack. Law enforcement believe the attacker may have worked as a painter or related role in the Kai Real Shopping Center. Cheryl Grace Smith was born in Covina, California, on June 14, 1946. She was raised primarily in the San Diego area. She was married to Roger Domingo, with whom she had two children. From 1964 to 1975, she had resided in Santa Barbara County from 1975 until the time of her death. Carrie had worked for Burroughs Corp in Goleta, where she had met Greg. Just prior to the attack she worked as an administrative assistant for a small manufacturer of office furniture trim industries, but had been laid off shortly before her death. Greg Sanchez was 27 years old. It is believed he planned on traveling to Florida soon after the attack, although he would never get to make that journey. It is unknown how the original Night Stalker selected Carrie and Greg as victims, through encountering her in her job, at leisure or from prowling the area. Carrie Domingo's daughter Debbie, 
who was 15 at the time, was staying with friends on the night of the attack. Her son was out of state with other family members. The home in Goleta belonged to Cherry's family and she was staying there temporarily. The offender had entered the property via a small window in the bathroom. Sanchez had not been tied. He had been shot in the cheek. Although not fatally, he was then bludgeoned to death with a garden tool taken from the property. Some believe Sanchez may have realized he was dealing with the man responsible for the murder of Offerman and Manning, and made a desperate attempt to tackle the killer rather than be tied up, as in the Offerman-Manning case. No neighbors responded to the sound of the gunshot. 1986 On May 4, Janelle Lisa Cruz, 18, was found bludgeoned to death in her Irvine home. Her family was on vacation in Mexico at the time of the attack. A pipe wrench was reported missing by Cruz's stepfather and was thought to be the probable murder weapon. She had also been raped. These murders in Southern California, Goleta, Ventura, Dana Point, and Irvine, California, were not initially thought to be connected by investigators in their respective jurisdictions. One Sacramento detective strongly believed the East Area rapist was responsible for the Goleta attacks, but at first the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Department attributed them to a local career criminal who had himself subsequently been murdered. Investigating the crimes that did not occur in Goleta caused local police to follow false leads related to men who had been close to the female victims. One suspect, later acknowledged to be innocent, was charged with two murders. Linking all of the cases together was achieved almost entirely by DNA testing, which was not done until many years later. The original Night Stalker Speaks Letters and Writings Excitement's Crave Poem In December 1977, letters were sent to the editor of the Sacramento Bee, the Sacramento Mayor's Office and the KVIE 6 TV station titled, Excitement's Crave, written in poem form by an individual claiming to be the East Area Rapist, though the authenticity of his authorship of the poem has never been proven. It is entirely possible that his successful evasion of the police on that morning inspired him to write it. First page, General Custer, S.A. Second page, Matt is the word, journal entry. The second page contains a journal-style entry where the author writes about a school teacher who made them write lines, and how humiliated they found the experience to be. I wish I had known what was going to be going on during my sixth grade year. The last and worst years of elementary school. Mad is the word that remains in my head about my dreadful year as a sixth grader. My madness was one that was caused by disappointments that hurt me very much. Disappointments from my teacher such as field trips that were planned and then cancelled. My sixth grade teacher gave me a lot of disappointments that made me very mad and made me build a state of hatred in my heart. No one ever let me down that hard before and I never hated anyone as much as I did him. Disappointment wasn't the only reason that made me mad in my sixth grade class. Another was getting in trouble at school especially talking that's what really bugged me was writing sentences, those awful sentences that my teacher made me write. Hours and hours I'd sit and write 50, 100, 150 sentence day and night I write those dreadful paragraphs which embarrassed me and more important it made me ashamed of myself which in turn, deep down inside made me realize that writing sentence wasn't fair. It wasn't fair to make me suffer like that. It just wasn't fair to make me sit and write until my bones ached until my hand felt ever horrid pain it ever had and as I wrote, I got mater and mater until I cried. I cried because I was ashamed, I cried because I was disgusted, I cried because I was mad and I cried for myself, kid who kept on having to write those damn sentences. My angriness from 6th grade will scar my memory for life and I will be ashamed of my 6th grade year forever. Third page, Punishment, Map 
a hand-drawn map of what appears to be a suburban neighborhood. Phone Calls Merry Christmas Call a previous victim received a phone call during the Christmas period of 1977. She identified the caller as the man who had previously attacked her. Watt Avenue, call. Shortly before 10.00 p.m., on the night of December 10, 1977, dispatchers from the County of Sacramento's Sheriff's Department and the City of Sacramento's Police Department received calls threatening an attack on Watt Avenue. Law enforcement patrols were increased on the night of December 10 in response to the new round of calls. It is noteworthy that the Excitement's Crave poem is also linked with exactly the same date of this bike chase. Is Ray there? Call. The very first known rape victim received wrong number. Call on January 2nd. 1978, the call was recorded, and law enforcement suspect that it may be the same caller who made a threatening call to her. Shortly afterward, gonna kill you, call. Later that evening, the same victim received another call, much more sinister in nature. This call was also recorded and identified by the victim as being the voice of her assailant. Final Call in 1991, a previous victim received a phone call from the perpetrator and spoke with him for one minute. She stated that she could hear a woman and children in the background, leading to suspicion that he had started a family. Investigation Detectives connect the crimes Even prior to 2001's connection of the original Night Stalker to the East Area Rapist, some law enforcement officials, particularly several from the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department, sought to link the Golita cases separately to the East Area Rapist and the original Night Stalker. Suspects eliminated Brett Glassby, question mark, from Golita, California. Glassby was considered a suspect by investigators in Santa Barbara County. He was himself murdered in Mexico in 1982. Glass B's death, prior to the murder of Janelle Cruz, eliminates him as a suspect. Paul Kornfed Schneider? Question mark, a high-ranking member of the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang. Schneider is a career criminal who was living in Orange County, California, when the murders of the Harringtons, Manuela Whithun, and Janelle Cruz occurred in the late 1990s, while serving time at Pelican Bay State Prison in Crescent City, California, Schneider provided a DNA sample to authorities. This sample cleared him as the original Night Stalker. Joe Alsip? Question mark, a business partner of the victim Lyman Smith. Alsip was a friend of the Smiths and visited their home on High Point Drive in Venture the day before the murders. Alsip's pastor claimed that he had confessed to him during a family counseling session, but this confession was considered dubious by the Ventura County District Attorney's Office. Nevertheless, Alsip was arraigned for the murders of Lyman and Charlene Smith in 1982. After the preliminary hearing, however, all charges against him were dropped. In November 2002, Journalist Colleen Casson wrote a newspaper series about the original Night Stalker murders for the Ventura County Star. According to Casson's articles, Detective Larry Poole of the Orange County Sheriff's Department visited California's death row at San Quentin State Prison in an attempt to locate the original Night Stalker. Detective Poole suspected that the original Night Stalker had been captured and sentenced to death for some other violent crime. Nevertheless, none of the genetic samples collected from death row inmates at San Quentin matched the DNA of the original Night Stalker. Psychological Profile After criminologists matched serological evidence found at the Southern California murder scenes, a psychological profile of the original Night Stalker was compiled. According to Leslie D'Ambrosia, who was the primary author of the profile. 
It is likely that the original Night Stalker would possess the following characteristics. Would continue committing violent crimes until incapacitated by prison, death, or some other intervention. Would have been described by those who knew him as arrogant, domineering, manipulative, and a chronic liar. In addition to describing the characteristics of the original Night Stalker, the profile also speculates about the fate of the killer. According to the profile, the original Night Stalker could have been incarcerated following Janelle Cruz's murder or killed in the commission of a similar crime. However, the last known contact with the original Night Stalker was in 1991 when he made a taunting phone call to one of his victims. As to the latter point, the profile indicates that law enforcement agencies should look into attempted hot prowl burglaries in the late 1980s that resulted in the death of a lone male offender. The profile also indicates that there is a slight chance the original Night Stalker committed suicide. Furthermore, it is speculated that it is unlikely that he is confined in a mental institution. The profile reveals that following the original homicides in this series, teletypes were broadcast to law enforcement agencies throughout the United States. These teletypes requested information on similar home invasion attacks involving sexual assault, murder, bludgeoning, multiple victims, and or bondage. As of 2015, no similar crimes have been reported in the United States. The profile propounds the possibility, however, that the original Night Stalker could have continued committing his crimes in another country, where records were not consulted for linkage purposes. As a psychological profile is based on a probabilistic analysis, its accuracy cannot be assessed before the offender has been apprehended. The original Night Stalker East Area Rapist case was the motivating factor in the passage of legislation leading to the establishment of California's DNA database, which authorizes the collection of the DNA of all the accused and convicted felons in California. California's DNA data retrieval and storage program is considered by researchers to be second only to Virginia's in size and effectiveness in solving cold cases. While the California DNA database motivated by this case has solved numerous previously unsolved cold cases across the country, the original case remains unsolved.